many people camping is missing, so I'm not sure everyone else is at. <laughs> but good to see all of you here. Good to see some visitors here with us. And, and uh, just enjoy the service. Let's start with a word of prayer, and then we're going to... Um, I'll tell you what, I'll do this first. God, I thank you card from Peggy. So I'm going to read that to you. It's more of a thank you letter. Thank all of you for your prayers and cards for to our family for the loss of our sister Dorothy Mary May Black. A more saintly soul you could not find on this earth. Family takes excellent care of me. We have a long way to go yet. And I sure miss all of you. I do not see anyone outside of the family due to the virus. I do go only to doctors and wound care. That is pretty much over with until the surgeon says yay or nay on surgery. We are guessing winter holidays before I can recover, if there's surgery, drive and go out on my own. God has allowed some hardships but these two years, these last two years, but he is always good and there with open arms. Those who send cards update me on how you are doing. It gives me courage to carry on. God is good all the time. I sometimes let the devil get me down and then I rein myself back in with how good God has been. We are trusting him for complete recovery. I will never get over John, of course, but God is helping me. And Stephanie is using her college psychology on me. <laughs> Remembering all of you and hope to be back to see you soon. God bless all of you. Thank you. Let's open the service with prayer. Father, we thank you for the fact that we can again be in your house. We pray that you be with us this morning. Give us a special touch of your presence. And help us just to enjoy being together, enjoy being in your presence, and enjoy being in church. We thank you for all you do for us, and let's bless the service in your name. Amen. Grab a hymnal, please. Turn with me to number 385. 385.
ten. Three ten. Keys are in your purse? Yes. And I did get the purse. So there's a lesson to be learned here, people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
there's entirely too much stuff in a woman's purse. <laughs> That's a real good sermon for today. Anybody else? Susie? safety this week um we don't realize how much you know yeah how much um god is working behind the scenes sometimes for protection i just nearly had a head on with a car i was coming back home from um, green castle and just past the bridge past tall, tall helms and um suddenly the vehicle in front of me um that I was following um whipped around to the left and there was a vehicle coming right at me and uh, I pulled over a little bit, and he was starting to go back to his lane, and then suddenly he just came right at, like, driving right at me. And so I had, thankfully, there was just enough room um, on the, there was grass that I could drive up into and just missed them. And so that was pretty scary, but I'm just thankful that, you know, God is protecting me. So if you go by that golf cart place down there by the ridge and you see the streaks in the air, you know, that's fine. <laughs> Oh, the car was on his cell. The guy, driver was on his cell phone, so don't be <laughs> texting and driving. I'm tired of getting calls from my wife that aren't good. <laughs> Got ready to take her phone from her. Maybe. <laughs> Give him a special touch. Encourage him to darling. 
be with Tim and Glenda. Give Tim a, a special touch. You encourage Glenda to lift her up. Be with Peggy. Would you encourage her? Give her healing. Think of um, the different other individuals that have ongoing struggles and concerns in their lives that sometimes are too heavy to mention. But Lord, would you just meet those needs? Anyone here today that's carrying a heavy load, Lord, would you just ease that load and uh, help them to enjoy being here and worshiping this morning? Think of um, Diane's sister and son that are struggling physically. Would you give them a special touch? Think of Sabrina and his um, nephew of Susie's or Caden. Just uh, reach down and help in these situations. So many families in our, in our uh, world today that are struggling with lots of conflict. And Lord, would you just re reach down in a special way, touch those lives that are affected by that. Thank you that Rebecca's back is doing better and help us to continue to improve and not get her fits while she's away, get her safety while she's traveling. But thank you, Lord, we can bring our care and concerns and our praises, Lord, we praise you for who you are, for what you've done safety and protection, for guidance and direction, and peace and comfort that you give. Now bless us in this service in your name. Amen. Most of you should have got the announcement that we're not going to have focus groups tonight in the gym due to some that are camping and just other things that have been going on that is making it too difficult to make it happen. Um, while I'm thinking of that, is there anybody here that's planning to go up to the campsite to have lunch today? Okay. I'm going to try not to be too long so you can get out and up there in time. Um, board meeting Tuesday night at 7. This Saturday, a Sunday school picnic at 6 o'clock. Bring a hot and cold dish. The announcement should be in the bulletin. September 13th. Sunday evening, and the quartet will be here to share with us. September 27th, Mary Ellen Curry, she was my sir, will be here to share, her and her husband will be here to share that evening. So, that's all the announcements I have. Yeah, we're going to play song. Turn with me to number 521. 521.
It was John Riskin who said, I believe the first test of a truly great man is his humility. I do not mean by humility doubt of his own power or hesitation in speaking his opinion, but really great men have a feeling that the greatness is not in them but through them, that they could not do or be anything else than God made them. Andrew Murray said, the humble man feels no jealousy or envy. He can praise God when others are preferred and blessed before him. He can bear to hear others praise while he is forgotten because he has received the spirit of Jesus, who pleased not himself, and who sought not his own honor. Therefore, in putting the Lord Jesus Christ, he putting on the Lord Jesus Christ, he has put on the heart of compassion, kindness, meekness, long suffering, and humility. M. R. D. Hahn used to say, Humility is something we should constantly pray for, yet never thank God that we have. In case you haven't realized it, I'm going to talk about humility. Now, I was going to say that Stephen and Karen's family and our family are the only ones that have children. Girls, some of you aren't children, okay? I, mean, I get that, but children still at home. And as far as I know, I'm sure they can affirm this, and we can, and those of you that have raised children and have grandchildren can say you don't have to teach a child to be cocky or arrogant or brag. That just comes naturally. But what is hard to do is to train a child to be humble? I did really good at that, didn't I? <laughs> All of us as human beings struggle to some degree with being willing to be humble. And obviously personalities come into play here, but I think if we were all to be honest, every one of us at some point in time has struggled with humility. Maybe we wanted credit for something we did, maybe, but then had to realize, you know, it really doesn't matter. Maybe what we wanted someone to know that we gave them that gift, even though we did it anonymously, but realize that that was a little bit vain. But I really believe the hardest struggle for any of us, and I think if we were to admit it, the hardest struggle for any of us is admitting that we don't need to be right all the time. Any of you struggle with that? In one of my study Bibles, I was recently came across this interesting view of the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness. It approaches the event by showing that Jesus was being tempted in his humility or his desire to be impressive or to be known for his abilities. And I'm not sure entirely why this message idea stood out to me like it did, but maybe it's because I feel like we're living in a time of history where everybody has the incessant need to be right. I was just talking to Cindy a little bit about this. In other words, my view of what's going on right now what precautions you should or shouldn't take, how you should or shouldn't comply, what kind of political stance to take, all of that. I'm most definitely right. And your views are wrong because you don't agree with me. Does that kind of sound like our society today? There are relationships being sacrificed at the cost of being right. <clears throat> A counselor once told me, what is more important, being right or having a relationship? I witnessed a very clear description of this going on on Facebook many times, just this past week. One person who possesses or professes to be um, very spiritual and close to God was arguing over something that didn't matter in relation to this whole COVID thing. And the person that he was arguing with, you could tell, had some, had some hurts. In reality, the argument was pointless, but the results, I fear, were damaging. Could we possibly take a page from the story of the life of Jesus and learn something about humility? Turn with me to Matthew chapter 4. Or type it in. I guess now that's our... 
day and age now. Everybody should be familiar for the most part with this story. It's a very common story, Jesus being tempted. But I honestly never looked at it this way. Matthew chapter 4. Going to read verses 1 through 11. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights afterwards, he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these things become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, You shall not tempt the Lord your God. Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away from you, Satan. For it is written, you shall serve the Lord, or shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and ministered to him. Follow closely as I show you what I read and discovered on this subject, and I believe it can be very helpful to us as Christians. Satan tempted Jesus in three ways regarding humility. And first, he tempted Jesus to be self-sufficient. So if you look back at verses 2 and two through 4, verse 2 states that Jesus was obviously hungry. He didn't eat for 40 days and nights. Then Satan comes along and tells Jesus, turn the stones into bread. Now that, to me, sounded legit, you know. Uh, Jesus would be showing his power to provide for life needs. It would show his power in a practical way. Why not? And Jesus said, he quoted scripture, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And I'll be honest, I had to think through this one. How is not turning these stones into bread showing that Jesus wasn't self-sufficient? And the key is the scripture that he used when he spoke to Satan. Basically, we weren't, aren't to depend on our own abilities or strength, but allow God to provide for us. And see, that's where most of us get stuck, especially in America. You know, we're trained to take care of ourselves, and we forget to turn to God. And he should be our first response, not our last resort. And unfortunately, there are many times when I find myself in a situation, and I'm concerned about it in the middle of it, and suddenly remember, oh, yeah, I didn't pray about that. Can you relate to that? We're, we're trained in society today, especially as Americans, like I said, we can handle it. We're Americans. We can, we can handle anything. Nothing can stop us, right? That's just how we're raised. And unfortunately, this trickles down into our spiritual lives, and it, it becomes damaging if we don't learn who is that source of provision and, and source of strength. D.L. Moody shares this story. Dr. Andrew Bonar told me how in the highlands of Scotland, a sheep would often wander off into the rocks and get into places that they couldn't get out of. The grass on these mountains is very sweet and the sheep like it, and they will jump down 10 or 12 feet and then they can't jump back up again. And then the shepherd hears them bleeding in distress. They may, may be there for days until they have eaten all the grass. The shepherd will wait until they are so faint they cannot stand, and then will put a rope around him and he will go over and pull that sheep up out of the jaws of death. Why don't they go down there when the sheep first gets there, I asked. Ah, he says, they are so very foolish. They would dash right over the precipice and be killed if they did. And that is the way with men. They won't go back to God until they have no friends and have lost everything. If you are a wanderer, I tell you that the good shepherd will bring you back the moment you have given up trying to save yourself and are willing to let him save you in his own way. Doesn't that sound like us? 
It isn't until we are totally weak and we've given up hope that we realize the only way out is through the shepherd's help. Have you ever heard the expression, let go and let God? Sometimes we just need to force ourselves to remember that. In his first temptation, Jesus could very easily turn the stones to bread. He was God after all, but he was also human at that point. And he wanted to create a perfectly clear example for us who came behind that he was relying humanly on his Father's provision. In his humanity, I think it was humbling for Jesus to not do something that would prove his self-sufficiency, that he could do it, because he could do it. And I like to think that because he was human at the time, he struggled with that because he struggles with, struggled with the same things we struggle with. It's humbling to realize that we're nothing in ourselves. It's humbling to ask someone else for help. But we need to remember, we are nothing without him. Acts 17, 28 says, For we in him we live and move and have our being. Can we learn something from Jesus, maybe? He was fully God, but yet he showed us at that point in time in his life he needed to rely on his Father. Is it, can we learn that it's okay to not be able to handle everything? Can we be humble enough to realize that we're nothing without God's provision and guidance? Then the next temptation Satan tempted him to give Jesus on was the temptation to be impressive. Now, I don't know how women think, and I'm really not sure that I want to. Um, however, I do think in this particular instance, guys may struggle more than, than girls, depending on personalities. There's something in a guy that, that gives such a rush to be able to get up to the plate and hit that triple that drives several runs in, or maybe shoot a 10-point buck, or build something like a table or a, or a cabinet out of walnut, or drive a golf ball 300 yards, which I don't do. Um, I'm speaking from the perspective of a guy. There's a, there's a rush that you get. I'm assuming some girls are like that. There's something about, something fulfilling about being impressive. Getting that fist bump as you round the bases and all the guys are, yeah, 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 that was awesome. You know? I have not done that either. <laughs> or seeing the look on your friend's face as you show them something you just built and they're like, wow, I kind of do that. Yeah, I'm pretty good. We as humans like to be admired. It's just part of who we are. That's why it's humbling ourselves to realize that you know, that affirmation isn't necessarily needed. It's tough. Let's look at verses 5 through 7 again. Verse 5 showed that Satan invited Jesus up onto the pinnacle of the temple. Now, I assume that means on the roof. And what guy would, wouldn't want to do that, right? Not, I mean, the highest part of the building. <laughs> Then Satan says, jump off. I mean, wow. See what happens. I mean, the worst could be you'll get hurt and the angels will come take care of you. I mean, that would be awesome to watch. It would show who you really are, right? Now, obviously, I sort of put that in many words, but that's what happened. Again, we have to understand that Jesus was human here. I think every human tendency would be, I want to prove a point. I can do this. I know I can do it. But Jesus know, knew by doing that he would be giving in to Satan. And rather he remained humble and again quoted the scripture, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. And what I mentioned earlier about being impressive, that implied to physical feats, but what about spiritual? So we, we can justify being impressive when it comes to spiritual things because we're doing something big for God. You know, I want to be another Billy Sunday or, or Clara Barton. I want to make a big impact for the kingdom. And there's nothing wrong. That's awesome. But who are we doing it for? Are we doing it for us to be impressive so people will look at us and look what they did? Or are we doing it because we want to give God the glory and use us and be able to be used by Him? We talked about self-sufficiency a minute ago, and this applies right beside it. If we do accomplish something big for God and, and take the glory from for it, do you think God is going to allow that to continue? Do you think he'll give us another opportunity? God will make sure no one steals, steals his glory. And I'll tell you personally, God has a way of making sure we don't take the credit for anything we've done. And to be clear, I don't think I've done anything incredible for God. But I know that anything I've accomplished, he has given me the strength to do it. 
He reminds me of that from time to time. So let's learn something from Jesus here and realize that we don't need to perform in order to become someone special. We simply need to allow God to use us and remember to give him the glory and praise for doing it. Then the last temptation that Jesus gave or was tempted in was the temptation to be powerful. Look back at verses 8 and 10, 8 to 10. Satan took Jesus up onto this really high mountain so he could just see the beautiful view. And I think it would have been cool. I mean, you look down the valley and see all the kingdoms and the nations, whatever. Satan said that Jesus fell down on his knees and worshipped him, then he'd give him all that to control. And of course, that wasn't in Satan's power to give anyway. But we need to remember that Jesus was human at the time and probably weak from hunger. And I don't want to be sacrilegious, but it's possible that he wasn't in even thinking clearly because he was human. He was weak. He was struggling. He maybe couldn't make a rational decision humanly. Or at least that's what Satan wanted, hoped would happen. What Satan was doing was appealing to the humanity of Jesus, the human desire to be in charge, to be in control. To a human, having that much power, that's pretty attractive. Satan was really testing Jesus, and Jesus gave him a harsh rebuke. Away with you, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. For it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And there's a really big lesson to learn here. Again, Jesus was fully God, but he was also fully man. And he was providing us a tremendous example of dealing with temptation, dealing with the temptation to be in power, to be in control. He was saying that as a human, he was going to worship his Lord first. Nothing was going to come in the way of that. He was going to serve God first. And if God wanted him to have power over this place or that place, then it would be a blessing of being a servant of his. I'm going to try to word this and try to explain this the best way I can and explain what's on my heart, but and I'll do this in phases. If you look in our government today, just, just look around in our government, it seems like everybody, no matter what side politically, they're all on power trip. They want to be in control. They want to have more power than the next person. And they don't seem to be concerned about the greater good. They're just concerned about their own agendas. Then think about society. When it comes to the corporate world, the same thing's happening. Everyone seems to be fighting to be in charge and be powerful and have affluence. There seems to be little concern for the person in the next office or the next cubicle or whatever. But it's my own back pocket that I'm most concerned about. But then I think about the church world. And this is where it really gets concerning to me. Because I've seen many people in the church world that just seem to be on a power trip. They want to be in charge. They want to have the most influence. They, they, they want things to go their way. And they want to control others around them so their agenda gets accomplished. Their own opinions cloud their decisions to the point that they're acting harshly and, and they're trying to make others follow them. And that's not what the church is about. Taking it to a more personal level, my personality is one that I like to be in control. I like to be in charge. Uh, that definitely helps when you're in a position of leadership, but it also can cause issues. And I've spoken to some of you that, about this topic, and you've shared with me on that. What do we do with this? Having a power struggle with someone or one to, wanting to be in control of things is not what God has in mind. So if we look again at the example of Jesus, he deferred to God... First, saying he was going to serve him first instead of seeking power. And that's what we need to do. If we seek God first and say, I'm serving you first, then he'll give us the responsibilities that he wants us to have. We don't need to fight or struggle over it. We need to acknowledge that God has all the power. He's in charge. I think, I think we clearly know that, but when it comes down to something like this, the subject of control or power, it's just we don't see it that way. Just think about it this way. What would have happened if, if Jesus would have given him to Satan and he would have worshipped him? Can you imagine the difference in the story? So much different. We wouldn't have that example to follow for one thing. But just imagine the difference. But since he did obey God rather than Satan, look at what power Jesus actually has. He didn't need to claim that power. It was his already. But because he, he was God at that time, but at that moment, 
in his humanity, he deferred to his Father. Now look at the power that Jesus has. Through him we have the forgiveness of sins. We have the hope of everlasting life. Stuff that Satan can't offer. So what might happen in our world today if people would quit seeking after power and influence and prestige and rather look to the good of others? We would have a worldwide change. What would happen in our churches if people would realize that God's in charge and we're simply his servants? It's humbling to allow someone else to be in charge. It really is. But if Jesus was willing, shouldn't we also be willing? So I'll be honest, I'm not sure if this message it came across the way I wanted it to and bring it to make the point I was trying to bring. But the big question is, are we willing to humble ourselves and realize it's not about us? We don't need to be right all the time or have control or, or look impressive or do things on our own. Are we willing to humble ourselves and get out of God's way, so to speak, and allow Him to use us rather than trying to figure things out on our own? That's a challenging lesson. And I really feel like in today's climate, with all the confusion, and all the arguing, all the bickering that's going on in society, we as Christians have a huge responsibility to display an attitude of humility, showing that, you know what? It doesn't matter who's right. I just want to show people that I love them. I want to care. And that should be the attitude of our hearts. And in turn, hopefully, they'll see Jesus in us through our humility in that way. Stand with me, please. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you that you saw fit to send your son to earth to live a human life that we can have that that example to follow, that we can see Jesus as a human, that we can learn from his example. We praise you, Father, for that. And help us to maintain humility and, and defer to you and, and realize that you're in charge, that you are guiding and directing us, and that we don't have to, to be right or have, have everything just the way we want it, but realize that we're working for your kingdom and to draw people to you. We thank you for our church family. Would you bless each one that's here this morning? Give safety going home and, and, and a good week. And thank you and praise you. Amen. Thank you for coming out.